Good morning, good afternoon, and hello everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our Southern California Chapters Spring 2023 webinar featuring a presentation by uh, Kurt Bruner. We're going to, I'm gonna turn things over to Lisa Colabella from the Rand Corporation to get things going today in just a moment. But as, uh, as the webinar goes on, if you have questions, please send those in the chat for us and we'll get to them at the end of the presentation. And we'll also be doing a few trivia questions today. So if you'll send your trivia answers in the chat as well, that will be great. So take it away, Lisa. Great. Welcome everybody to the Spring 2023 webinar for the Southern California chapter of ICEA. Um, this is Lisa Colabella. I'm actually in New Jersey this week. Don't tell anyone live in Southern California normally. And just uh, wanted to uh, welcome you. And uh, the first thing we're gonna talk about, uh, we're gonna talk about uh, you know, the uh, activities coming up, uh, tell you about, who, remind you of who, who's on the board. Uh, and we will uh, also uh, have this wonderful briefing by Mr. Uh, Kurt Brunner on exploring uncertainty and risk. Then we'll have some announcements and some recognition and a closing. These are the members of our of the board here. Uh, Karen Marikas is our, our esteemed president. Uh, I'm serving as vice president. Charlie Merritt is secretary. Uh, we also have uh, directors at large, um, Dan Kennedy, Connor Lawson, Shannon Pryor, Cassie Shevlin, and Melissa Winter. And uh, also Danny uh, Bleedy and Steve Sturk uh, is serving as well. We also have some uh, wonderful volunteers who meet with us regularly and provide excellent input. Uh, Dara Villa, Tom Bosmans, Kurt Brunner, of course, Rich Harwin, uh, and Hank Apgar. I just wanna start by reminding you of some uh, upcoming activities. Of course, we have the spring webinar, which is occurring right now. Uh, there'll be a fall one that is coming up. Uh, we'll tell more about that later on. We'll send some more information about that. Uh, we hope to have at least one face-to-face -face workshop, uh, and th that's still in the early planning stage right now, but we'd love to see you all in person and hope that you'll make that. Uh, of course, there is the upcoming, uh, that most of you know about, the annual ICEA Professional Development and Training Workshop, which is going to be May 16th to 18th in San Antonio. Uh, we look forward to seeing you there, and there will be a gathering for folks in the Southern California chapter. So we hope to meet up with you and, and see you there. We will um, uh, have more information about that. Cassidy Shevlin uh, is going to be organizing that and she'll be sure to reach out to folks and let them know about that before the workshop happens. Um, and uh, other news, uh, board member Steve Sturk from NASA and Connor Lawson from Summit to Sea. They're working with a professor at USC, Professor Madhu uh, Thangavelu, uh, to organize a cost estimating competition for university students. And specifically, it's gonna be a, a data uh, analytics and cost engineering collegiate challenge. It's gonna be for college students in Southern California. That's also in the planning stages, um, but uh, they're, they're actively working on this and planning it with USC. USC is definitely participating and uh, hopefully other universities as well. Um, and uh, last but not least, um, our wonderful board member, Cassidy Shevlin, she is organizing a beach cleanup in Doc Weiler State Beach on June 3rd from 9 to 11 a.m. So for those of you who love the beach as much as you love cost estimating, uh, we hope to see you there June 3rd from 9 to 11. And uh, so keep an eye out for future announcements. Oh, now to Karen. Karen handles a trivia. So she's very good at, at running that. So we have a trivia question. Karen, over to you. I think Karen is still on mute, so um, I'm I'm going to go ahead and ask this, and you're welcome to write uh, your answers in the in the chat. And I think uh, Megan is uh, is keeping track of them, and we'll see who wins this question. Uh, the, the first trivia question is: In what city was the 2022 ICEA Annual Professional Development Training Workshop held? So we'll take a minute or two to write your answers. Hey, this is Karen. I had trouble unmuting myself, uh, so 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 thanks for filling in, Lisa. No problem. And I kept trying and trying, um, and so 
So if you if you've attended any of our Southern California workshops or webinars in the past, you know you'll know that we always have some ICA trivia questions, and uh, winners will get a coin from the Southern California chapter. It's a challenge coin, um, and I'm hoping that this is an easy question. There is a second question coming up later on in the the uh, program that may be a little bit harder for some of you. Um, but what we can do is, um, let's see, Megan, have we gotten any responses yet? And if not, we can go on to the program and we can come back to this. We have, but um, my question would be, Madam, are uh, board members from the Southern California chapter eligible to win one of your <laughs> coins? Oh. I'm going to say no. Okay. <laughs> then I think we're going to need, I think we might have one winner, but uh, there we go. Saudi Rizvi, we'll, um, we'll connect you guys after the event um, for your challenge coin. The answer for those who haven't either read it or don't remember was Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And we had a rocking good time too, I think, if I dare say. Well, a hearty congratulations to you, sir, for, for winning that uh, the contest. And now we will move on to our main feature which is Mr. Kurt Brunner. Uh, he is a senior principal parametric cost estimator at Latos. Kurt has extensive experience doing aerospace and electronic cost estimating for government agencies and contractors. He's a founding member of ICEA. Uh, and I found it really interesting uh, to hear that he has a degree in anthropology, uh, which no doubt helps him to uh, do all the digging that's needed to get data for cost estimating. Uh, Kurt is also an avid motorcyclist, so he has personally experienced risk. And that brings us to our topic, which is Kurt, Kurt is going to talk about risk and specifically exploring uncertainty and risk. Uh, he's going to clarify these concepts um, and talk about how to quantify them. So with that, over to you, Kurt. I'm going to take this moment to uh, switch slides over to Kurt's slides. Well, salutations, everybody. Can you hear me OK? Sounds good to me. Okay. Uh, well, somewhere in the speaker's handbook, it says I'm supposed to engage everybody by telling a joke. So here we go. Uh, a bunch of cattle are sitting around playing poker and smoking a joint. The stakes were high. Okay. Don't get any better than that. Uh, so when I was a young cost <laughs> estimator during the Pleistocene era, uh, I, I used to think that there was a single solution to everything, a single point that, that uh, was the correct answer. Uh, but now that I'm older, I know everything's some sort of dirty, fuzzy snowball. So that brings us to our topic, which is exploring uncertainty and risk. Uh, next slide, please. So some of the stuff we'll talk about today is, is kind of semantics. Is it uncertainty or risk? What types of uncertainty there are? What happens when you have a lot of uncertainties and you compound them? Uh, the meaning of frequency and consequence. Uh, I'm going to present a simple way that you can quantify uncertainty for those that are mathematically challenged, like myself. Uh, also, we'll discuss contingency, management reserves, and bias a little bit. Next, please. Okay, do we say uncertainty or do we say risk or can we use them both? A lot of times they're used interchangeably. People tend to use the term risk most often, but a lot of times that's inappropriate. Risk kind of has a negative or a pessimistic implication in terms of out, out, outcome. However, things can happen such as uh, being efficient and innovative that can be a positive influence. So uncertainty is probably a more precise or exact terminology to use because there's both optimism and pessimism in all of the things that we do within an estimate. Next, please. Okay, there are 
a lot of different types of uncertainty. And you can break them into two general types, known unknowns and unknowns unknowns. And both of them should be considered, but often of them, but often they aren't. And uh, to quote my friend, uh, Dr. Christian Smart, who I've stolen some slides from, by the way, he says it's always more uncertain than you think, even taking into account that it's more uncertain than you think. Next slide, please. So first of all, there's the known unknowns, and these are the things, the factors and events that happen that are uncertain and are likely to change, and they're pretty common from program to program. And once again, we can arbitrarily break them into two halves. One is the technical known unknowns, which are things such as weight or slot. When we go to the solutions architects and ask for inputs to use in our modeling, they'll give us some number. For instance, slot, they may, might say it's 1,582,315 lines of code. And we know that that's not exact, that that's plus or minus some amount. Uh, and so that's one unknown. The other is the cost modeling variability that we have in our CERs. If you look at this graph here, you'll see that there's a data set that defines, uh, first of all, the mean, and then there's also a best fit line, and then there's prediction intervals around that with the standard error being defined. And those prediction errors, as you get further away from the mean, become wider and wider. They they have a set of wings like Red Bull. Okay, so that's something that we need to take into account. We know that the CER isn't exactly 215 hours per uh, pound of aluminum or, or the like, that it's something plus or minus there also. So not only is the weight or the slock or any number of other inputs variable, but so is the CER that defines that. Uh, these, these are pretty frequent, they're quantitative, they're objective, and these are what people usually address when they do an uncertainty analysis. Next, please. There's, there, th this is kind of a pictorial of weight, for instance, and what happens there. We have on the bottom, we have the technical uncertainty which is a variable, and then you compound that with a modeling uncertainty, that is your CER uncertainty, and the, un the total uncertainty then grows considerably as a result. Uh, next slide, please. But there's also the unknown unknowns, and these are the things that irregularly affect programs, those are the ones that people tend to leave out. And some examples of those uh, are labor strikes, acts of gods, acts of God like weather, hurricanes, earthquakes, sinkholes, and the like. Pandemics, who could have foreseen five years ago what was going to happen with COVID and how that would impact everything? Then there's impacts from other programs like when the Challenger disaster occurred. All NASA shut down all of their programs, and they all got delayed, and they all had cost growth as a, as an as, as a result, which then influences our our data history. Terrorism would be another one. Canceled programs are something that we ignore. Canceled programs are the ones that are lousy; they get canceled, so that horrible history that's real history tends to get included in databases. One I didn't mention here is politics. You could have a crazy governor that uh, wages war against your particular corporation. So these things occur infrequently. They aren't always predictable. They're usually negative. Uh, they're difficult to quantify. A lot of times people will go through CERs and say, hey, this isn't going to happen next time, so we'll eliminate that from our database, and they tailor the CER. And the problem is that these things do happen, and they need to be included in the history. 
at least in, in my op- opinion. So a lot of times we overlook the unknown unknowns in uncertainty analyses. Next slide, please. So another cartoon here, you're in the SS cost estimating Titanic and you're sailing uncharted seas trying to come up with an estimate. And you see the peak of an iceberg there, that's the known unknowns. And you you accommodate and try to steer around that. But on under the surface of the of the sea is all of these unknown unknowns that you have no way of of really being able to predict accurately. And they're waiting to reach out and rip your hull open and sink your estimate. Next estimate, please. Or next slide, please. Okay. And then when we're doing estimates, we tend to do most of our estimating at a lower level level of the WBS rather than top down. And then we try to sum everything together. Uh, and the problem is, is that that does not really indicate the nature of the whole because these factors all are interactive and, and can multiply each other. Next slide, please. Uh, simple pictorial here. We have six point estimates being done at a lower level. And we can look at those and some of them are log normal, some of them are triangular distributions. And if we take the mean of each of those and sum that up and say, well, that represents what the total is, that's not really accurate. Uh, next slide, please. Because when we run a Monte Carlo of all of those independent distributions, we find that what we thought was a 50% confidence level is really 20%, as you can see on this S curve here, where the probability of occurrence is on the, uh, <clears throat> is on the Y axis and the cost on the, or resource usage, number of hours, et cetera, on the X axis. So my point being that point estimates significantly underestimate cost and schedule. Next slide, please. So there's two dimensions to risk or uncertainty that are usually not totally addressed to the extent they should. And that's frequency and consequence or likelihood or probability and consequence. And people tend to, to always address what's the frequency, what's the probability of something occurring without really addressing What's the consequence? And this is one of our risk cues. We'll go into this a little bit more uh, in, in a few slides on. Uh, go ahead, please. And so here's the importance of consequence. One is uh, example here, and this is another stolen chart, is Pascal's wage where Pascal says, there's no real downside to believing in a deity. That, uh, that the downside is if you don't believe you could spend eternity in a not very pleasant place. Uh, and then there's also the dirty hairy sort of analogy or I, I tend, where are you feeling lucky punk where there's one bullet in the chamber? Like if you're uh, playing Russian roulette and you've got a, a revolver, you've got about a 17% probability of coming up with the uh, on that chamber when you're pointed at your head. But if you come up on that 17%, which is a low probability, uh, the consequence of what happens is dire. So the point being that consequence is really more important than frequency. Next chart, please. And these are two different risk cubes. They're equally productive for all intents and purposes. And once again, on the y-axis, we have the probability, likelihood, frequency, whatever, however you like to define it, defined as anywhere from not likely to likely to near certainty of occurrence and percentages assigned to those. Uh, but on the consequence line, on the y-axis, it is a little bit more 
subjective in that we have defined those as negligible. If, if this if this occurs, it really doesn't impact things to any great extent, minor, moderate, serious, all the way to critical, meaning that it's a show, real showstopper should that act, should that uh, event occur. And it, in, and on these two different cubes, one has a very high, the other one's simply high. Probably the bottom one is more accurate. The SAR data that I have indicates that very seldom, less than 5% of the time, do we have a very high degree of occurrence in terms of how tax cost. Uh, next slide, please. So now that you have those risk cubes, what do you do with it? You want to quantify that somehow. Well, this is a way we came up with of quantifying things in a very simple, linear, mathematical sense at either a high level or at a lower WBS level, and then you run your Monte Carlo or the like. And what we did is say, based on conventional wisdom, a gut feeling, a low amount of risk adds maybe 10% to your cost. So that's a factor of 1.1. A very high amount of risk or high amount of risk doubles the cost or resources. And then from that, since uncertainty is an exponential function, you can extrapolate then what a medium of risk is or a very high amount of risk. Low risk being 1.1, as I said, 1.4 being a medium amount of risk, high risk 2.0 multiplier, and very high risk being a 3.0 multiplier. Uh, and how are those derived? Uh, next chart, please. For those of you that have never seen this, this is the way we did things in the Stone Age when we used carbon paper and rulers and protractors. This is a log log graph. And at the at the baseline axis, we have a factor of 1.1. At the uh, doubling factor, we have the 2.0. And then the mid midpoint between those is the 1.4 or 4% uh, increase. And then a very high, it would be a three times increase. So that's where the factors that I presented on the previous page come from. Next slide, please. Okay, so then you want to put some boundaries around this because as we started off, we said it isn't just risk, it's uncertainty. So we have a distribution that's a plus or minus distribution. So low uncertainty would be minus 10% to plus 10% or 0.91 to 1.1, medium 0.91 to 1.4, high 0.91 to 2, and very high 0.91 to 3. Very seldom in the data do we underrun a program by more than 10%. And you say, well, Kurt, why is it 0.91 instead of 0.9? Well, we work the math, you can see that 1 divided by 1.1 is 0.909, or rounding it to 0.91, which is probably more significant figures than it allows. If we were to run a Monte Carlo using the points of 0.9 and 1.1, and we would find out that we're always slightly uh, on the uh, underrunning side, that the result would be like 0.99 overall. And obviously that's not correct. That's why we have to have this, uh, this adjustment factor of using 0.91 instead of 0.9. And okay, so we've come up with these ranges. Why, why are these any good? Well, there's other studies that, that correlate with this. Uh, there in the backup, there's some selective acquisition reports data from 112 programs, the task, uh, did data collection on that show overruns and overruns on those programs and how severe those underruns and overruns were uh, that collaborate with this with these ranges. Uh, at one time, we used these uh, the Air Force cost analysis 
a cost analysis agency, AFCA, use accepted those ranges and even incorporated this methodology into their risk handbook at one time. I think they've come up with better, more uh, more specific ways of doing it now. And we also presented these to the OSDK and they had no dissent with using this particular methodology. Uh, next page, please. Okay, uh, I wanna talk a little bit about contingency and management reserve. I once worked with a manager, we'd go to a lot of work to be very quantitative and come up with an exact estimate and ranges and the like. He'd say, oh, that's all very good. Now let's add 20% to it and lock it up. And he did that as his buffer or as his management reserve for when things went wrong. And that's all well and good internally. And it, that's a protection against unknown unknowns or undefined risks. And the problem is, is that puts subjectivity that you can't quantify into another, into an otherwise objective analysis. And these arbitrary contingencies aren't allowable as BOEs in an auditable proposal. And that's according to FAR. Uh, next page, please. So that's what the government says you should do. However, what the government says and what they do are two different things. As you may know, what the DOD does when they establish their budgets is they develop their own independent cost estimate. And that's got uncertainties and an S curve that's associated with it and confidence levels. But they use the mean or the point estimate as the requested project funding in their uh, president's budget or PB. And hopefully the Senate says, okay, that's how much money we'll give you. And then we go out and it's, com it's competed uh, with the contractors and it's awarded at as low as a 20% confidence level. So basically they're funded at a certain amount and they award it at a lower value you know, assume at 20% they feel is realistic for an innovative, efficient contractor. Data shows that people can actually perform at the lower confidence level, given that nothing goes wrong. And then they have all this money that they're holding back. And that that's, that's typically what they use to fund uh, program growth, scope changes, schedule delays, ECPs, and other, uh, overruns, that is the unknown unknowns that they didn't cover in their ice. Also, uh, a corollary to all of this aside issue is that a lot of, uh, that when the ice is done, there are published factors called withholds that are added to the ice at a bottom line. And that percentage depends upon which service we're dealing with, whether it's the Air Force or the Army, what program type it is, is it aircraft, is it gr ground, excuse me, and what project phase, is it O&M or is it development? So they add an arbitrary factor also to, to their estimate, which is not allowed for a contractor to do. Uh, next slide, please. And then there's the matter of bias. And these quotes are kind of interesting. A couple of them are from the GAO that cost growth has been caused by poor cost estimating. At times, estimates that were more realistic were available, but they weren't used. Uh, GAO testimony that only 15% of the programs assessed began development having demonstrated all their technologies being mature. In other words, TRL levels uh, were very unrealistic that were presented by contractors or by the management of contractors. Uh, the DAU says budgets may be deliberately overstated or understated. Uh, and uh, there's a publication, the elusive challenge of estimate costs, which says that it's been found repeatedly that programs produce optimistic estimates in order to gain approval for funding. Uh, and if I can stand on my step box a little bit, 
when I looked at uh, at the SAR data that I've referenced earlier, some 44% of the programs either perform with near what they were budgeted at or uh, slightly under the budget. So overruns aren't so bad as aren't as uh, prevalent as we tend to think they are. That the overruns are the things that uh, the newspapers pick up on and publicize. Next uh, page, please. So I, I need to tip my hat here to my colleague, Mr. Jason Rupinski. Uh, he put together these words and some other wonderful ones too, which I'm not presenting today, but garbage in, garbage out. That's a serious issue. We have all these wonderful analytic tools that have the ability to do great things and give us insightful results. But there's all of these inputs that go in there. And when people bias the inputs, whether it's the solution architects or the program manager telling you, no, that that's not a realistic assessment or the guy that creates the CERs that decided that he's going to tailor the CER and take out all of these strange events that happened in the past, that really biases the estimate and it's garbage in and garbage out. So if you don't, recognize that, then the results that you come up with are meaningless, they're misleading, and potentially dangerous. Uh, next slide. So, if you had one slide out of this presentation, should you download it? This would be the one slide that tells you everything that we just discussed about. It's an eye chart, but, it, but here's everything. In a nutshell, I'm certainly not going to read it now. So uh, this is your takeaway. Next slide, please. Okay, and that's really all I had prepared to discuss. There's very much, much, much more, you know. And with that, I will open it up to discussion and questions. All right, we, um, Kurt, we did get one question for you so far, and everybody, if uh, you have your questions brewing, you can use uh, this moment um, to think of your questions. Um, and while I'm here, the second question just came in. Um, the slides will be available to download on the ICA website, icaonline.com slash SoCal, um, by around lunchtime tomorrow. Um, the first question for Kurt. You mentioned on slide seven that canceled programs or other unknown unknowns are not captured in historic, historical data typically. This could easily lead to optimistic estimates. How can we effectively, oops, effectively inform decision makers who often want to see the optimistic estimates so that they can take these risks and uncertainties into account? Well, it, it can be difficult, as I said, to quantify those. I think the first of all is to make sure that the history is all inclusive. It may not be exactly the same event. You might not have an earthquake this time. You might have a pandemic or the like. However, these events, especially in gross, when you go through all of the averages, of what the performance actually is and how they impact your cost estimating relationships. Uh, you need to make sure that those are included, that you want, have it overly tailored your CERs. And, and that would be one way of doing that. And then also addressing the biases saying that, hey, just because you say this didn't happen this time, you're not going to make this mistake again you're gonna make a different new mistake. Uh, you know, that may sound flippant, but it really is the case. We always uh, find new ways to, to prove that we aren't perfect as humans. Okay. Okay, just give Any. me one, one moment, please. I'm sure, gonna... uh, of I course. Am... Actually, I'm just gonna... Denise Nelson has a question. Denise, if you can unmute, if you want to ask it, you can go right ahead. Uh, thank you. I, I didn't know really how to, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. 
Okay. Yes. I didn't, Hi, Denise. Hi, Kurt. Um, I really didn't know how to ask the question by writing it out, but like you would, because you had hinted on this, um, that we're not allowed to add risk to our proposals uh, when we submit to the government. Uh, but when you do a firm fixed, I think like we're sometimes we're allowed to add a little risk or like estimate the line items at 80% confident. But are we not allowed to estimate like the roll up at 80% confident? Um, I'm trying not to say anything proprietary here, but what are the rules sure. of the government okay. in adding these risks? <laughs> well, so. basically, you need to quantify why you're adding risk or uncertainty, whether it's statistical or or historical. You need to do. You need to couch it in such terms that it's not just, "Hey, I'm a subject matter expert, and I know." that there should be 20% more or whatever number, 20% seems to be a real popular one, that you need to have some sort of documentation and logic of why you're doing that. Does that help? It does, and it sounds like the quantification, because like I know, for example, we can add, and it makes sense what you just said, because we've had software growth to the lines of code, but we don't add growth to the cost, you know? So I think actually you made a good point. I can quantify why we add software growth. So thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Denise. Looks like Rich would like to know, uh, can you discuss how contract type affects risk? Pardon me? Rich Harwin? Asked, uh, can you discuss how contract type affects risk? Type of contract. How how type of contracts impact risk? Right. Was yeah, like firm question? fixed, firm mm -hmm. fixed versus mm -hmm. cost yeah, plus. Yeah. Well, okay. Mm -hmm. Firm fixed uh, contracts tend to be awarded at a lower price because all of the risk is really on the contractor when it's firm fixed price. Whereas when it's cost plus, there's more people are more circumvent in awarding a contract as now the risk is shared or is owned more by the customer, by the government. Is that basically uh, what, what the question was alluding to? So you, you've got a uh, contract that's awarded at a lower confidence level compared to the government ICE or the customer's ICE when it's a firm fixed price sort of activity as opposed to a uh, cost plus or cost share type contract. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Rich said that addressed his question. Karen, you had a few things to say? Right, Kurt, this is Karen Marikas. Um, and just for um, other folks on the line, uh, Kurt and Denise and I all met, oh, 20 some years ago. <laughs> um, and it was Denise Nelson and my first experience with cost analysis, uh, cost estimating, affordability analysis. And so we actually learned a lot from Kurt. Um, but so my question is, I remember from those days, uh, we were on GPS three and unfortunately we lost it. Um, but anyway, at the time we were doing some cost risk analysis and my understanding was that it was acceptable. Uh, the government felt it was acceptable to submit risk um, or to include risk at the 70% confidence level. And then I think at some point it dropped down to the 50% confidence level is what they were looking for. And now it may be back up to like the 70%. Do you, do you happen to know what the government is looking for? You know, government in general, or like general government con um, customers, do they typically look for a 70% confidence level or 50% or 80 or or as as you just mentioned, you know, it could depend on the type of the contract. Now, I do want to add well, a caveat to, I'm sorry to interrupt, Karen, but Karen and I are working on a life cycle cost, not a proposal, right? Just to be correct. clear. I'm sorry. You are correct. Okay. Uh, once again, that does kind of go back to the previous question. What sort of contract is it? Uh, generally, the way 
there's not a hard and fast rule that here here's what you can add, but dependent upon uh, the type of contract and also just who your specific customer is. The goalposts that are normally used are somewhere between 20% to 80%. So that's pretty wide or about one standard deviation or so. That usually if you're within there, you can argue one way or another with a reasonable person, not that you know, the, who you were dealing with was reasonable, but uh, that that usually is the kind of range that you, you want to, to be in. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right, quick question, Kurt. Um, I was just gonna ask you, uh, you, you mentioned that when they're, they're unknown unknowns, uh, that people tend to leave out, they tend to exclude the outliers, you know, they're developing CERs. And I, were you suggesting that, that they shouldn't do that then? They should basically use the data as they are and don't take out you know, uh, observations that are kind of unusual? I'm, I'm an advocate for using data as, as it exists without going in and massaging the data. That, that way you capture the real range of possibilities because when, when you do your analysis, you're going to look at the CER has a standard deviation. And once you start excluding data, you're influencing what that uh, optimistic and pessimistic boundary is on the CER. And mm -hmm. it takes away the realism, once again, this is my opinion, from doing that. Uh, I know there's a lot of people that do CERs and they spend a lot of time looking and saying, oh, this program, this happened that was unusual. And so we're going to exclude that. And then when something unusual does happen, you have no proxy for it. It may not be exactly the same situation, but especially when you have a large data set, I think it all comes out in the wash, so to speak. Um, yeah. And like I say, also, the other thing, you know, usually when you use CERs, just by nature, they're a little bit optimistic because programs that got halfway through, as I said, and got canceled, their data is usually not included in CERs because it's not a complete program. People don't use ECAC data when they when they generate their CERs. So there's a lot of, there's a whole lot of programs that never came to fruition because they did perform so poorly and you don't have that experience in your CER. That's a really good point. Very interesting. Are there any more questions? Yeah, Lisa, we did get one more um, a little a while, a little while ago. Kurt, is there a good way to create a simple range for an audience expecting to see just the point estimate? Uh, I, I don't know of a simple way. I think the best demonstration is to is to provide an S curve like one of the earlier charts had that show here's the here's the likelihood of this happening versus the resource usage that is or or the cost uh, if you have to just use a single point you could say plus or minus x percent and use the old the 20 80 percent confidence level as your goal posts or 30 70 depending upon the sensitivities of who you're talking to but it, it, in any case, it needs to be verbally addressed that, you know, that if you're using the mean, this is given that everything is the average contractor and everything's being done uh, uh, based on industry standards. And uh, if, you use, if you've centered it on a lower, lower confidence level, you say, hey, this is assuming we're better than the average bear that we're an innovative, we're an efficient contractor, that we're not going to make any mistakes, everything's going to go well. That doesn't exactly answer your question, but in any case, it, it needs to be spoken to, even if it's not demonstrated on a chart or on the numbers.
Okay, that so, is that's all the okay. questions we got um, at the moment. Um, I know Karen and Lisa, you guys had some chapter business if you wanted to maybe get to, and then um, if we get more questions while that's happening, we can come back to those. Right, and actually I did, this is Karen, I did have a, one comment that I wanted to make. Um, so this goes back to, you know, 20 some years ago when Denise and Kurt and I were working together. Um, but this was not, uh, Kurt was not involved in this um, discussion. But we were creating a life cycle cost estimate and I had been, and I believe Denise too, we had been doing some research on the internet uh, about cost uh, as software um, cost increases and how historically um, it seemed as if the software increases for programs uh, was like three times more than what the estimate was. And so being brand new to cost estimating and analysis and affordability, I naively mentioned to our program management, well, if our you know software estimates are typically three times less than what it turns out to be, why don't we just multiply our estimate by three and then submit that as our life cycle cost estimate? And people just laughed and I'm thinking, what? what? And they're like, well, we'd never ever win a program if we did that. So, so that goes back to sort of my first comment about a question about optimism and you know our um, our leaders often want to see the lowest estimates and they they kind of want to ignore that hey all these bad things or or potentially things could happen that would make the estimate go way up so we don't want to bring any attention to that um, but i just thought i'd share that right and and how often do people really go into the guts of your cer what programs were included there and how were those cers developed were, were there programs that were scalloped out or were they adjusted in some way? Right, yeah, yeah, it's just using historical data, you have to spend a lot of time really understanding it to, to know what, what was included in it and can it apply to your current situation? But okay, so moving on to um, our second ICEA trivia question. So remember the first one was, where was the 2022 ICEA annual professional development and training workshop held. So this question is, where was the 2021 annual um, workshop held? And you can um, either send your response to Megan or, well, send your response in the chat. Okay, I see somebody has ah. got the answer already. It was sort of a trick question. Um, so 2021 was, it was a virtual uh, workshop because we were still in the midst of COVID. So 2020, it was canceled. 2021, we were planning on doing it. Um, and so I'll ask a, a second question. Uh, does anyone know where we were planning on doing it in 2021? Nice, great question, Karen. That may be a little bit harder. Oh, uh, nope. Nope, that's close. Aaron said, Aaron Veltman guessed San Antonio. That is close. That's where we were supposed to be in 20. Does anyone else remember? <laughs> what? Uh, okay, we're getting warmer. You're getting closer to his state. Um, Yeah, Denise got it. Okay. Uh, now, Both the state and the city start with an M. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Come on, one more guess and we'll give it up. Yes. Well done, Nicole. And I think, uh, doesn't Twin Cities refer to also Minneapolis and St. Paul? It does. But specifically, it was Minneapolis. You're right. Mm -hmm. So, and for those of you who really want to go to Minneapolis, isn't it planned for there next year? Why, yes, indeed. We, um, we're, we, we're going to be picking up where we left off. And uh, we got a really cool hotel. Um, it's in an old train station. It's like, oh, a, cool. yeah, it's a train station from the 1800s that they turned into a hotel. Into a hotel. Um, so the general session room is actually the old train platform. So there'll be the glass um, ceiling with all the you know, iron work and stuff. It's, 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 it's awesome. So yeah, head on out to Minneapolis. It's going to be great. 
All right, and back to you, Lisa, I think. Um, okay, yeah, I think we're gonna have some announcements here. And I think actually Megan was gonna cover these announcements. Is that right? Sure, my um, pleasure. Sure. Uh, so we know that the workshop is in San Antonio in May, May 16th through the 18th, um, due on Saturday morning or perhaps closer if anybody is interested in participating in the first ever I See a Cost Challenge. We're inviting teams of junior analysts, three to five junior analysts folks with less than five years experience to come and compete. Um, we're going to have a data set that they'll receive in a series of questions and the teams will have to come up with a presentation to give to our judges at the workshop. And that will happen on Wednesday during the workshop and then on Thursday afternoon at the closing general session, we're gonna name the team that had the best estimate, um, not necessarily the right answer estimate because the question's gonna be a little, uh, little off the wall, but who gave the best presentation, who backed up their findings the, the, the best and they will win a thousand dollar cash prize to distribute among their team how they choose. Um, also happening at the workshop, this is happening on Monday. Um, so when you're picking your flights, if you haven't done so already, and you want to attend the ICEA OEM forum and networking event on May 15th, Monday from three to five, um, make sure you tick that off uh, when you sign up for the workshop. And if you didn't notice it or did, but weren't sure if you wanted to go to it, just go ahead and send us an email at ICEA at ICEAonline.org and we can just add you that to that list. Um, the OEM forum and networking event is free for anybody who is registered for the workshop and you don't have to be an OEM employee to attend. If um, it can be, um, you can be, if you're just interested, go ahead and go ahead. Uh, and I, I will add that we are having a presentation on negotiation strategies. Um, someone from Lockheed Martin is presenting that. Actually, uh, it's Brent Johnstone, who is the best paper winner for the past two years, I believe. Three. So he's present oh, three. Okay. He's presenting on uh, negotiation strategies. And then we will have a panel of um, leaders from different OEMs and the focus of that panel is to talk about acquisition or talent acquisition and retention mm -hmm. because we all seem to be struggling with finding people who do this type of work um, and and keeping them interested so um, and then we'll be talking about a few other things as well but those are the the main things we'll be discussing at the OEM forum and networking event um, the ICEA board election is open until Saturday. If you have not voted, uh, please do. I'll be sending out a reminder to everybody tomorrow. If you are a current member and didn't get a ballot, email us at ICEA at ICEAonline.org and we'll be happy to send you one. Um, that voting will close on Saturday. Um, another thing that's exciting is CBOC 2.0. We, we spent several years updating CBOC from uh, admittedly cumbersome PowerPoint slides and series of Excel workbooks uh, into a readable Wikipedia style format that's got cross links and, and all sorts of things. And it is no longer a mail you a thumb drive or a CD-ROM like we used to do when I first got here. Um, it's it's all on a browser and once you when and it's free for all ICEA members. So when you log into your ICEA account, you'll be able to see the link to CBOC 2.0 there. And uh, as long as you're an ICEA member, you can access it for free. If you're still into PowerPoints and Excel files and prefer it that way, we still have some copies of the old version of CBOC available for sale. So if that's something you're interested, we can still work that out too. Um, and also in CBOC news is CBOC S, the CBOC for software, cost estimating body of knowledge software, rolling out soon as in pretty darn soon. I expect to be able to be releasing those or announcing those in within the week. Um, so if you're a software estimator or interested in software estimating, that is definitely something you should check out. We're also going to be rolling out a new uh, software cost estimating certification or the SCEC and um, that will the very first exam for the software estimating will be taking place in San Antonio. Uh, let's see where are we? Oh also and, go ahead. Oh, Megan I was going to ask is um, the training this year at the workshop solely focused on the CBOC S the software cost estimating? Yes and no. 
Um, yes, in the sense that the traditional sit in a room, watch a person go through slides is going to be all on software CBOC. But we will be setting up a sort of a study hall for um, folks who are preparing for the PCEA or CCA exams, where we will have the, uh, and actually um, we will have these, the new CBOC training videos available, which I'll talk about a little more in just a sec. Um, and some, some experts and already certified CCEAs there to help do study questions and ask and, and uh, answer specific questions and go into detail. So it's, it's going to be a little more casual for the standard CBOX stuff, but I actually think it might, it might work for certain folks' learning styles, um, you know, to, to kind of come in in a group environment. So it might be a really good fit for, for everybody, and we're going to be, um, we'll be we're letting everybody know about that very soon. Um, but what I mentioned, and we just announced this yesterday, um, finally, 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 we've got some CBOC based video training. Um, you may remember from the 2021 workshop that was online, well done all. Um, we ha made some videos and now we're going to be, now we're there able for you, they are now available for you to purchase and stream sort of like a Netflix situation, um, be able to log on and, and view your videos over and over again if you like. Um, those are linked on the main page uh, as well as most of the pictures you're seeing here, everything uh, we're talking about is up on the main page, so you should, you'd be able to click on it and uh, get more information there. Including the latest issue of ICEA World, which is really going to be talking about the workshop coming up. And um, while we don't have anything planned for the machine learning working group in the immediate future, I do believe they're working on getting something together for the summertime. So keep an eye out for that. There should be more activity coming from the machine learning working group. Um, in the next few months. I think that's me. Great. Thank you so much, Megan and Karen. Yeah. This is just a reminder of our contact information for those of us in the Southern California chapter. Um, I think this is at the website, but if you would like to take a screenshot of it, you're most welcome and to reach out to us. If you have you know, ideas, activities you think would be nice for the chapter to do, we'd love to hear those. Uh, you know, if you have an idea for the next webinar of, of a good speaker, if you'd like to speak yourself, uh, if there's a topic that you think you'd like to cover, uh, please let us know. We'd, we'd love that kind of input. Just want to thank you and uh, provide a, a virtual coin over to uh, uh, Kurt Brunner, who did a wonderful job talking about risk and uncertainty today. Just a, a really important topic that is, is uh, not always well understood and really valuable. Uh, and we have, we have pretty good attendance today, it looks like. And I think that's that. Uh, it speaks to your uh, strength as a, as a fantastic speaker, your expertise and uh, the interest of the topic. Uh, I wanna thank everybody for attending. Uh, you'll be getting a survey and we would love to get your feedback on it. And again, as mentioned before, please let us know if there's a topic you wanna present, we'd love to, to hear from you. Uh, we'll see you soon. See you in San Antonio uh, if we don't hear from you before then. Thank you everybody. <laughs>